Um, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, happy Mardi Gras. I hope you're all having a fun time. I hope none of you have got arrested yet. Um, and I hope um, if any of you have been searched, you did exactly what I'm going to tell you to do um, at some point throughout this contribution. But I'll start by acknowledging we're on Bunjalung land and pay my respects to those elders past, present and emerging. And I don't know about you, but every time I come into Nimbin and I have a look at those hillsides and the sort of the, the richness of this landscape, and I, and I realise that there's that 60,000 plus years of prior occupation and continuing occupation from the Bunjalung people, I realise how much we have to learn from First Nations peoples. And I can tell you now, if First Nations peoples were in charge of Australia, we could end RDT tomorrow. So, because um, uh, they kind of get this nonsense. Um, so anyhow, your rights with police. I'm also going to do some stuff about roadside drug testing and I'll talk about sniff off. Um, so, the war on drugs. The war on drugs is a pretty simple thing, really. It's where you give a bunch of, a, the largest uniformed uh, group of people who can uh, commit legalised violence on us, we give them more power. That's what the war on drugs is. We just empower the police to have more power and to be able to exercise more micro-violence and macro-violence against us as a community. And overwhelmingly, that power is exercised against young people. That's what the war on drugs is. We just empower the police to exercise increasing amounts of power against young people. Um, also people of colour and, and First Nations people. It's, it's quite simple, really. It's not really a war on drugs. It's actually a war on people who take drugs. That's what the war on drugs is. If you could just have a kind of neutral war against a bunch of things on your shelf in the pantry, that would be OK. But it's not. It's a, it's a war against the 20, 30 per cent of people in this country who will take recreational drugs in any given year. And it's a war against the 50 per cent of people who have taken rec recreational drugs at some point in their life. It's a war on people. Um, I'm going to give you a kind of cook's tour of some of the things you should look into and you should be aware of if you're stopped by police and they're asking to do a search of you. But I would urge you to get onto Sniff Off, um, like the Sniff Off Facebook page. Um, if you don't know about Sniff Off, search for it on Facebook. Sniff Off is a collaboration between my office as a Greens MP and the Young Greens, part of the New South Wales Greens. And I think we've got a bunch of the um, Young Greens and Sniff Off crew here at Mardi Gras. So, so welcome, guys. Um, uh, so it's a collaborative project, but if you get on to Sniff Off, you'll find the video that takes you through in some detail um, what your rights are when you're being searched, what you should and shouldn't do. It's much more entertaining um, than I will be, and it's also slightly more detailed. But um, um, what are the motives? What, why are we having this um, war on drugs? What, what's the purpose of it? Um, well, I've said before that it's used to justify giving police significantly greater powers to limit and violate our civil liberties. I mean, uh, many of you would know that the, the uh, criminalisation of cannabis came about through a pretty ugly racist trope that was developing in the United States against, um, um, against people who were... Uh, um, against what was seen as a Mexican influx into... Uh, pure and nice and white North America. There was a real racist trope that eventually that that started the criminalisation um, of, of cannabis, and and that linking of cannabis with marginal groups who the police want to and and other parts of society want to continue to over police and oppress. That's continued through to this day. Um, and I've got to say, the most obvious example of this police overreach is the drug dog program. And of course, Sniff Off is largely about getting rid of the drug dog program in New South Wales. The drug dog program is kind of unique to New South Wales. Is anybody here not from New South Wales? So, from Queensland? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of embarrassing as a New South Wales uh, resident to say, you know, in some respects, Queensland is slightly better at civil, civil liberties and rights than New South Wales. Traditionally, that hasn't been the case. You know, the great land of Joby Occhi Peterson and the Midnight Mafia. Um, but um, even Queensland doesn't give their police the same powers that we give in New South Wales about drug dogs. Um, sorry? Yeah, interestingly, that's where the drug dog program first came in. 
The police got a whole lot of um, drug dogs and explosive dogs during the, uh, for the Sydney Olympics in 2000, and they developed a drug dog unit. And at, at the end of the, the, the Olympics, they didn't really have a task for these dogs or this increased number of police that they had who handled dogs. So they put a proposal to the then Labor car government to actually repurpose the unit. So instead of doing kind of explosives and events, they would be able to then convert to a drug dog unit and just go out without a warrant um, and search people on the streets using their drug dogs. And, and that is actually um, how we got a drug dog program in New South Wales. And it's been a disaster ever since. Drug dogs can be used in New South Wales without a warrant um, on public transport. So if you're ever in on, on a train in Sydney, you will often get off at a, if you get off at a train station like Bondi Junction or Central, um, or particularly Redfern, where there's a large numbers of Aboriginal people and young people, you will um, very often find yourself being having to walk past dogs and uniformed police, and you'll see people being pulled aside and humiliated and publicly searched. You know, welcome to Sydney, great global city where we shut down the pubs at one o'clock, one o'clock in the morning, um, and we search you randomly using dogs when you catch the train. Great place. Um, can be used on public transport, in licensed venues, in tattoo parlours, um, in, in, in parts of the city, such as all of King's Cross pretty much, and the main streets in, in the CBD itself, all up and down George Street, basically wherever young people aggregate, that's where they've decided that they can be used without a, um, without a warrant. Do they work? Any guesses about whether or not drug dogs work? Uh, actually, they don't. Um, they don't find drugs on at least 70% of searches. So um, somebody's getting off the train at Redfern, they walk up the stairs, a dog approaches that, a dog on a leash surrounded by often 10 to 12 police, um, approaches them, and then the handler will say that the dog has indicated that you have um, drugs on you. And, and often, uh, very often, people will say they couldn't see any indication from the dog. The police say, well, the dog will sit down uh, beside you. Very often, that's not the case at all. There's just some sort of mystery signal that the police see, and they use that to say, stop, we're going to search you. And of those searches, uh, across the board, 70% of them don't find any drugs. Turns out, that when you're doing policing, relying on the opinion of a dog is a pretty dumb idea. Okay, um, who would have thought? So, basic tips for if that happens to you. Um, now, this might be if you're walking out um, in, Marty, um, in Nimbin, you'll be pleased to know that the police will have gone to the local magistrate up here and they will have got a warrant to allow them to, to use their drug dogs in Nimbin for the Mardi Gras festival. They'll have turned up to the um, magistrate and they'll say, well, look, we have reason to believe that at Mardi Gras some cannabis may be consumed, um, and for that reason we would like a warrant to allow us to use drug dogs and just randomly search people up and down Nimbin. And the magistrate will then sign off on a little map which puts a sort of line around Nimbin and anywhere in that region for the course of Mardi Gras, police will be able to use their drug dogs, and that's why they're operating here now. In fact, <laughs> as I was walking in to Nimbin from where I'm staying down on, on Falls Road, uh, there was an almighty fight happening in the back of the police drug dog van. Uh, it looked like the, you know, the, the dogs were attacking themselves and very, very aggressively having a go at it. So there's a lot of dogs here. You'll see them operating, and they will search you. Basic tips. Um, take notes following your interaction with police. It's always a good idea. If, if it's been a negative interaction in some way, record it. A really good way of recording it is flick yourself a text or an email um, about what just happened. So you've got it contemporaneous. And if it becomes an issue that you've made it up later, you can say, well, actually, no, I didn't make it up later. Because you can see from my text and my email, I actually sent it at 3.32 just after that thing happened to me. It's not a bad idea. Um, uh, it is legal to film the police while they're going about their duties in public. Uh, some people didn't know that, some people feel really anxious about it. Sometimes the police will be quite aggressive if you're filming them in public. You are entitled to film the police going about their business in public. You're not entitled to interfere with their operations, so I would recommend strongly that you stay a respectful distance away from the police. But if you're, you know, four or five metres away from the police, you're not interfering with what they're doing, you're not making a commentary, you're just filming what the interaction that's happening, you are entitled to do that. 
And if a police officer then comes to you and starts acting aggressively, say, look, officer, I'm within my rights, I'm not interfering with what you're doing, and sometimes they'll then demand to take the phone off you. They have no rights to take the phone off you. Sometimes they'll demand to get the password to unlock your phone. You don't have to give them the password to unlock your phone. Um, but of course, if you're at that point, I'm telling you what all your rights are, but you're an individual. You've got three or four police, a bunch of dogs all hanging around you, all being very insistent. It's really hard to stand up for your rights in those situations. Um, I accept that. So you can film the police, stay a respectful distance away from them. If you think a request or a direction is unfair, don't swear, don't use violence, don't resist. Because if you do that, you're going to find yourself up on a charge. They, they call it the trifecta, assault, police, resist, arrest, offensive language. It's called the trifecta. And if you get charged with those three offences, assault, police, resist, arrest, offensive language, you're facing some serious criminal charges. And, and what will have gone from an unpleasant altercation will suddenly find yourself in court um, four or five weeks down the track and being told by your lawyer, you've been an idiot, um, you're probably going to, you may well get a conviction. Don't swear at them, don't, definitely don't physically resist um, and, and, you know, um, behave in a respectful way. Um, I would recommend if they say, if they start peppering you with questions, you simply say, is it an offence if I do not answer? Are you telling me I must tell you these things? And most of the time, you, they, you, you do not have to answer the questions that the police give you, and I'll give you a little bit uh, more detail on that. Um, so so um, the last thing is um, I would strongly recommend you don't try and justify yourself, you don't give an explanation for yourself, unless you've got a lawyer there with you who's advising you to do that. Don't try and justify yourself. So just quickly, um, um, when do you have to give your name to police? So most people think that if the police stop you and say, what's your name, son, or what's your name, um, that you have to respond and give your name to police. Most of the time, you don't. The only times you do is if you're driving a car. So if you're driving a car and the police stop you and they say, what's your name, show me your licence, you have to give them your name, you have to show them your licence. But if you're just walking down the street and they stop you and they say, what's your name? Um, show me some ID. You are not obliged to do that. Just say, I'm sorry, officer, I don't have to give you that detail. Um, are you saying I have to? Uh, are you compelling me to do this? And they'll say, no, we're not. Um, but if you are driving a car, you have to give your name. If you're under 18 and you're drinking alcohol in a public place, um, then you have to give the police your name. The theory being the police will then take you home to your mum and dad and rouse on you. Um, if you are suspected of being invo involved in or witnessing a serious crime, so if there's just been a violent robbery happening and you're a witness to it and the police come up and ask you your name, then you have to give them your name. Um, and the last thing is if you're involved in a car accident and the police turn up. Normally they don't. But can I just go back to the starting point? If you're minding your own business, walking down the streets of Nimbin, the police don't like the look of you, they stop you and they start peppering you with questions, you're not obliged to give them anything. Right? If they then charge you with something, if they say, I believe that you're in possession of um, 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 an illegal drug, and they say, I'm now going to, um, I now want to search you because I believe you're in possession of, of an illegal drug, you can then just say, I don't consent to this search. Are you saying I have to comply with the search? And if they say yes, I would recommend you then comply with it and get one of your friends to film this whole interaction once it starts derailing like that. So, you have a right to silence in New South Wales still. It's a little bit complicated if you've got a lawyer with you, but if you've got a lawyer with you, the lawyer will tell you why it's complicated. But if you're by yourself, minding your own business, apart from giving your name in the circumstances I've said, you have otherwise a right to silence. And if you don't listen to anything else I tell you today, listen to this, use your right to silence. Don't justify, don't explain, don't put things in context, just use your right to silence. Um, um, and police cannot arrest you just to ask you questions. They can only arrest you if they think you've committed an offence, and even then, they're only meant to use the arrest powers in a more limited set of circumstances. So a really good thing to remember is, will I commit an offence if I don't answer? Unless they say yes, don't answer. And 
I mean, before I came into parliament, I practiced as a lawyer for 14 years. I only did a very small amount of criminal law. But inevitably, whenever I had a criminal law case, your clients always talk to the police. Always talk to the police. I will tell you now, don't talk to the police. Don't provide answers unnecessarily. And half of you, the next time you have an interaction with police, will start telling them your personal story, why you were there, where you bought the drugs. Ugh, don't do it. Don't do it. Um, right. Can police search you? Um, they can only search you if they have a reasonable suspicion. So is a drug dog sitting down next to you a reasonable suspicion, do you think? I see one person shaking their head. Do you reckon a drug dog sitting down next to you is reasonable suspicion? Yeah, I don't think it is, all right? And, and we have interrogated the police about this. We put a bunch of freedom of information requests to the police to get this, what are called standard operating procedures for how drug dogs operate. And initially, like when we first started doing this about eight or nine years ago, the police, first of all, their, their first set of standard operating procedures said that once a drug dog indicates that there is drugs, that they use that as the basis for reasonable suspicion to then undertake a search. We, of course, then got all the data, which proves that drug dogs are wrong 70, or in, say on the transit police, 75% of the time. And all of a sudden the police realised that if that's ever tested in court, they may have no reasonable suspicion at all. And in fact, the whole search may be unlawful after that point. So now the police standard operating procedures say, it's not just the drug dog indication, it's a variety of other um, indicators we're not gonna tell you about that led to us deciding that Mr. Shoebridge should be searched. He was at Nimbin, he's a Greens MP, he kind of looks like the type, um, and the drug dog indicated. I don't really look like the type, but anyhow. He, um, um, uh, and that's why we conducted the search. Um, and you know, you're a young male, you're in a hoodie, um, you kind of look a bit Aboriginal, you look like you might, have a bit, you look like you might be a person of colour. Um, that's why we conducted the search, um, as well as the drug dog indication. So, um, police are meant to tell you why they're searching you. So if they stop you with a drug dog, they're gonna undertake a search, they should say, I'm searching you because we have a reasonable suspicion to believe you're carrying drugs because of what the drug dog did. Um, and they can't just search your car without a warrant. Again, if they stop you, and, they, and, and I'll deal with RDT in a little bit, if they stop you and, um, and you pass you, you pass all the roadside drug tests and there's, there's no particular basis that they've identified to think you have drugs in the car, they're not just allowed to search your car as of right. They have to have had some reasonable suspicion before they start the search to justify the search. So, um, in a search, if the police have decided to search you, again, if there's only one thing you remember about searches and search powers, don't consent to the search. So a police officer is good at getting consent. They'll say to you, excuse me, uh, madam, do you mind if I search your bags and have a look at you, given, what the, um, given what's happened? You know? And if you say yes, you've given up a whole lot of your rights. All right? If they say to you, driver, would you mind stepping out so I can have a search of your car? And you say yes, you've just consented to the search. So if they say, would you mind stepping out so I can, of the car so I can search your car? You could say, well, yes, actually, I do. Do I have to do this? Because I don't consent to it. And they'll say, yes, we're directing you to it. He said, and you say, okay, but I want it clear that I didn't consent. And then you allow the car to be searched. If they say, would you mind stepping over here, we can search you, you say, well, actually, I don't consent to being searched. I don't want to be searched. And they say, well, I'm telling you, I'm directing you, it's a lawful direction, you have to be searched. And you say, okay, fine, but I want you to note that I didn't consent to the search. Don't consent to the search. Um, what happens during a search? So during a search of your physical person, not of your car, they can pat you down, they can look in your pockets and your bags, but they can't strip search you in public. That doesn't mean they don't. And we've seen a whole series of cases, um, particularly where Aboriginal men have been humiliated on the street, having their pants pulled down and police peering down their underpants on the street. Totally unlawful, totally unreasonable, grossly inappropriate. It does happen, but it's unlawful. They're not allowed to strip search you. They can pat your clothing. They can check in your pockets. They can look at your bags. They can ask you to remove a jacket or a, or a coat. Um, they can ask you to take off your hat. They can ask you to take off your shoes. All right? They can um, look in your mouth, but they can't poke around in your mouth. 
and they can run their hands through your hair. That's what they can do on a standard search. If you refuse to be searched, then you might get arrested, then you might get a resist arrest charge. If they've directed you to, to, to follow a search, I would recommend you do it. On occasion, and, and on, on an increasing number of occasions, the police, when they find nothing on their initial search, will then escalate it to a strip search. They're only meant to do that if they have a compelling reason to escalate it to a strip search and it's necessary to ex ex um, execute a strip search. Um, um, but they have been doing this more and more and more over the last few years. And in fact, strip searches in just the last four years have increased by almost 50% in New South Wales. Um, in just the last 12 months, the total number of strip searches has increased by almost 1,000, or almost a quarter, in just the last 12 months, a 25% increase in the number of strip searches. We're up to above 4,000 strip searches being done by the New South Wales Police every year. Um, and in almost two thirds of those cases, the police found nothing. Now just stopping there, I said before the war on drugs is a war on people, and it's a war on young people in particular. Think about a young woman going to a music festival, excited about the day, got the ticket, been looking forward to her ages, going there with, with, with her friends. And at the start of the music festival, she's pulled across and, and searched, no drugs are found. And then the police decide to escalate it and say, no, because of how you look, because of, you're at a music festival, because the drug dog looked pretty certain, I'm now gonna escalate this to a strip search. She's then taken away, stripped naked, humiliated, violated, nothing is found in two thirds of occasions, and she's told, oh, you can put your clothes back on and enjoy your day at the festival. How do we agree to that? How have we let that happen on 4,000 occasions in a year? It's a pretty obscene outcome, and this is just like a, a graph representing that. I can tell you now that we're building a broader coalition against these strip searches, and in fact, I think sometime in the next fortnight, I'll be down doing an event with a couple of key lawyers in the Redfern Legal Centre and some community legal centres about a campaign that's been launched to see if we can litigate against the police on these strip searches and to reverse this number and protect people from this kind of abuse. And if you thought it can't happen to you, that's from yesterday at Central Station. Central Station in the city, the police were pulling people aside and strip searching them behind those barriers in Central Station people just going home, catching the train to go home. We weren't going to a music festival, just going home, and that kind of violation was happening to them. Um, so, searches. Don't consent, don't resist, um, but know your rights. Roadside drug testing, kind of an issue of the week, the perennial issue up here in Nimbin. Um, the scheme is, there's a nice summary for the scheme, the scheme is shit. Um, why is it shit? Well, um, it tests for just the presence of drugs, not impairment. And, and the legislation doesn't even set a minimum concentration. The Australian standards for, for scientific testing for drugs set the minimum standard, and it's the smallest detectable quantity of drugs. The smallest detectable quantity of just four drugs is what they test for with roadside drug testing. Tests only for cannabis, MDMA, amphetamines, and now cocaine. The only reason they test for cocaine is because we shamed them into doing that over the last three or four years. We had a coalition government that all the data said was smashing particularly um, the north part of the state in southwest Sydney with roadside drug testing. And, um, and all of the major, and, and, and the, the most comprehensive study of drug use in Australia apart from the surveys, the most comprehensive government study of drug use in Australia actually tests the waste water that comes out of sewage treatment plants. And so this is a national scheme, uh, part of the Australian Federal Police. They go around and they literally dip little test tubes into the shit that comes out of the wastewater facilities um, from major wastewater treatment plants all around the country. They test about a dozen or two dozen of these wastewater treatment plants. And guess if you can, the, um, the wastewater treatment plant that like blew the charts uh, for, for quantities of drugs, cocaine in particular. Any guesses? Canberra. Not Canberra, no, no. Canberra's up there, but it didn't do it. 
Malcolm Turnbull's electorate, the great seat of Wentworth, blew the charts. They had to come up with a new scale to include the amount of cocaine that they found in Wentworth. Um, their estimates is about a ki kilo of cocaine is consumed and works its way through um, the, uh, the various the, uh, the, the bodies of the good burgers of Wentworth. And, um, and there was so much data showing that the biggest surge of drug use is actually cocaine. That's the one that's been growing at an even far greater rate than ice use. And it's all happening in major coalition-held electorates. We just spent ages torturing about them, torturing them on that in Parliament, and said, "You've got a shit scheme. Why is it you don't test the rich? You only test the poor." And we shame them into putting cocaine in. But it's still only testing for presence, and it's still only four drugs. The class of drugs that actually is responsible, probably for the most road trauma, by impairing drivers and and and, and causing accidents, isn't an illegal drug. It's not cannabis. Probably not alcohol. Um, um, it's certainly not cocaine or MDMA. It's almost certainly benzodiazepines and those, those that raft of prescription drugs, Zoloft and the like, that um, are, are, are probably the drug with, which causes the most road trauma in New South Wales. And particularly when benzodiazepines are mixed with small amounts of alcohol or small amounts of cannabis or other drugs, particularly dangerous on our roads. And, and, and the law as it currently stands is this. You can leave Nimbin tomorrow, having smoked a joint yesterday, and have a tiny trace element of cannabis in you. No impaired driving. All the studies tend to say that after four hours or so after you consume cannabis, you're basically you're, you're safe to drive. You're not legally safe to drive, but roughly four hours or so after cannabis, for most people, you, you're not going to be significantly impaired in your driving. Um, it varies with different people, so don't treat that as a as a, um, as a as a golden scientific standard. But you know, about four years after you, four, four years four hours after you that's the New South Wales Police speaking. Um, four hours after you consume cannabis, most of the effects have worn off, um, unless you've had a you know huge huge quantity. Um, but benzodiazepines can hang around in your system for ages. So you can leave Nimbin having smoked a joint on Friday, drive out on Sunday afternoon, get pulled over by police. You fail the, um, the, the, the oral swab, you get the second test, it goes off to the lab, they find a tiny, tiny amount of THC in your system and bang, you're suddenly a criminal, you've committed a serious offence, you lose your licence for six months. The car behind you can have a driver zonked to their eyeballs in benzodiazepines, like serious menace on the road. Um, get pulled over, go through the whole same testing regime and just be waved on by the police. Please carry on down the road and, you know, put at risk the good burgers of Lismore. That is a nuts regime. That is a nuts regime, but that's the regime we have. And as I said, you can test positive for days or sometimes even longer after consuming cannabis. There was one case actually up on the Northern Rivers where it was the better part of a fortnight after consuming cannabis, they tested positive. What's the procedure? I mean, probably a bunch of you know this. Who's been had the oral swab on the way in or the way out? Two, three, four. That's not bad. There aren't that many drivers, I gather. Um, so this is, this is the process. If you're stopped by police for drug and alcohol tests, they ask for your licence. They'll normally do a breath test for alcohol. And it's then that they'll normally say, we just want to screen you for RDT. They'll, um, they'll put the screening test on your tongue, swipe it around on your tongue until they get enough saliva from your tongue. They, um, and then you hand it back to police, or sometimes police will do it themselves. And then there'll be a chemical change or not, depending on whether or not you've failed the test. If you've failed the test, they'll then take you to the next stage. If you pass the test, they say, thank you very much, go on your way. Fail the oral swab, then they will take you out of the, take you out of the car, and they will do another test using a roadside, um, uh, roadside machine, which is normally containing one of those police vans. It's called a Draeger 5000. It's a, I think it's a German, um, German machine. The Draeger 5000, it kind of looks like a big techno toaster. Anyhow, they test it in the Draeger. And if you pass that test, so if, you, if, if, it, if, if it comes up negative, they say, OK, you can go back and drive, and you can drive home but we're still going to send this sample off to, the, um, off to the laboratory to be tested. So you fail the first test, pass the second test, you can drive away, but they're still going to send the sample off to the labs, 
And more often than not, once that sample's tested, they'll find a tiny trace element of cannabis in your system and two or three months down the track, you'll get a, a, a court attendance notice to go to court and um, potentially lose your license. If you fail that second test, so you failed the swab test, then you fail the second test, the police will suspend your license immediately for 24 hours. Um, your car will be parked on the side of the road and uh, you'll be directed to find another way home. Um, and it's unlawful to drive for 24 hours. Then after 24 hours, your license will, will, will be returned to you. Well, the suspension will end, um, but the sample will go off to the laboratory. And if you fail the sample, um, if you fail that test, again, you're taken to court and you lose your license for six to 12 months all on the basis not of being impaired, but on the basis of the police finding the smallest detectable amount of cannabis in your system. How should it work? How do we fix it? Well, there is a growing movement across the state to fix it. In fact, I brought some um, petitions, which I might sort of hand out at the end of this to get people to sign and return back to us. We need increased public pressure on it. Anybody who finds out about how the RDT system works, or pretty much anybody, realises it's dumb and says we should fix it. Um, apart from the New South Wales government and the New South Wales police, apart from the Liberal Party and the National Party, pretty much everybody else um, thinks that it's a dumb system and should be reformed. We need to sort of spread the word, get the petitions. You need to go and demand changes from your local MP. We need to suspend the current scheme and we need an urgent parliamentary inquiry. You'll be pleased to know that the recent state election through the New South Wales Upper House in particular into chaos. We have um, a massive crossbench. We've got three Greens MPs in that crossbench. And there's a mood to try and actually do some of this kind of work in the New South Wales Upper House. And I hope we'll get an inquiry into roadside drug testing in the very near future. You're all invited and welcome to put into submissions and come and tell the politicians collectively how stupid we've been. Um, so what should RDT be? They should be testing for impairment. If you're impaired by drugs, you should not be driving. So if you've got cannabis in your system at a level that's going to be impairing your driving, you should not be behind the wheel of a vehicle. And if the police find you with that level of cannabis in your system, of course, that's when your license should be suspended and or removed. Um, if they find you with a level of alcohol in your system that impairs you, of course, that's when you should be losing your licence and facing criminal penalties. In fact, that's how it works with alcohol. But the same should be said for benzodiazepines and other prescription drugs that we know will impair people's driving. If you're impaired by any drug, it doesn't matter whether it's legal or illegal, you shouldn't be behind the wheel of a motor vehicle. And when you look at some of the more sophisticated um, regimes in, say, Europe or the UK, they are particularly conscious of how drugs interact with each other. So when, when you look at all of the, um, uh, all the crash data um, that comes from millions of road, of road accidents in Europe, one thing you find is that cannabis and alcohol mixed together can really impair your driving, much more than just cannabis or alcohol by itself. So if you're found with cannabis in your system, perhaps what we should be doing is lowering the alcohol, um, safe level of alcohol to 0 0.02 rather than 0.05. Um, if you're found with benzodiazepines and alcohol in your system, there should be a very low level for each as well. We need to be much smarter in how we do this. But what we shouldn't be doing is losing your licence because you had a joint last Friday. It'd be like losing your licence because you had a beer with your mates yesterday at a barbecue. Nobody should be standing for this. Um, sniff off. Last time I looked, sniff off, which is the um, Facebook page from the collaboration of my office and the Young Greens, that had 58,000 followers and it's growing. It's a real presence where we actually dis discuss drug law reform. And increasingly, the media are going to sniff off to find out the stories about how the war in drugs is misfiring. And I think as recently as yesterday, that hallowed um, agent, the Daily Mail, um, um, sifted through sniff off and found that most recent thing that happened at Central. And it became a national news story driven out of sniff off because as more people follow and like Sniff Off and post on Sniff Off, we get more information about how the war on drugs is failing. I would urge you to do that. It's only in New South Wales for now, but you'll be pleased to know we have plans to take it national. There'll be a big public float. Um, what do we know? Well, we know this. We know that prohibition is not the answer. It's failed, it continues to fail. So what is the answer? And this is what I'll leave you on. 
The New South Wales Greens went to the last state election with a very clear policy that we will legalise cannabis. Legalise it um, and, and ensure that it doesn't just follow the way alcohol and tobacco has gone and go into the hands of big pharma and big corporates. If we legalise cannabis in this state, it should be lawful to grow at least five, five, five plants yourself um, without having to engage in commercial trade. And we would also want to legalise it in a way that the um, commercial production of cannabis is largely done by cooperative and not-for-profit ventures rather than big pharma and big corporates. That's how we think we should legalise cannabis going forward. And rather than a bunch of drug dogs, we should invest in harm reduction initiatives such as pill testing. And indeed, we should legalise and regulate MDMA as well as part of a, a, a package of reforms on drug law reform. And maybe we could actually make some money out of this. We could cultivate a hemp industry, and it was lovely to see the big um, hemp plant delivered earlier. I don't know if anyone saw that coming off the back of a truck. Nice big hemp plant, great big heads being delivered and dropped over. I think it's just across the way there. Um, we do have a sort of small hemp industry. It's time we got rid of some of the pointless regulation on hemp so that we could have a much bigger hemp industry. And of course, the money that we currently waste on jailing and monstering people on the war on drugs, we could spend that on drug education, drug research, and a whole lot of rehabilitation. Because particularly in the regions, because we waste billions and billions of dollars on policing and monstering people for drugs, there's no money available, or the, the, the government will tell you, there's no money available for the essential rehabilitation units that a whole lot of families have come to my office and said, my young boy, my daughter, my wife, my husband, um, he has got a, a serious ice addiction problem, and the nearest rehab is in Newcastle, and I can't get in for six months. What the hell am I going to do? My life is a misery. Why is there no money? It's because we keep pissing it up against the wall on drug dogs, police, and courts, and jails on this endless and pointless war against drugs. Thanks very much. Like a hemp plant across the road, all the paperwork has been done. We've yeah. tried to have them here in the hall before, but they were taken away from us. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, if you want to see a hemp plant, there's one over across the road. And no, no point sneaking in tonight and ripping the leaves off very low THC. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. Um, do we have some questions for, uh, for David? Okay. Thank you, David. Um, Last year, someone was getting searched here in the main street and I filmed it for them. And the one police officer told me that um, they could seize my phone and that I could be called to court with the footage. So I, I didn't think it was true, but at the mm. time it confused me. I thought maybe that's just the law they've got running this weekend. Or maybe it's New South Wales or... No, there's, there's no special Nimbin law to say that they can nick your phone in Nimbin like they can't in, in uh, Wollongong. Um, if, if I said before, if you're a witness to a serious crime, like a crime that's going to carry a criminal penalty of five or more years, then they can demand your name and then they can demand your details because then they want to be able to get you as a witness. But if you're witnessing just someone being searched and they're maybe going to get a cannabis possession, you don't have to give them your name. You don't have to give them your phone. You don't have to cooperate with them. You can't interfere with them, and they definitely can't... Well, they can demand the phone off, phone off you, like I could demand your phone off you, but they've got no more powers to get your phone off you in that situation than I have. So tell them that's lovely. Don't give them your name. Don't give them any more details, and wish them a happy day. Thank you. Yep. So uh, you had been talking about the amount of time that, uh, or, the, or the minimum quantities that they can detect in the roadside tests, um, and considering that those aren't tied to impairment or anything, if you had documented evidence, you mentioned uh, some, someone who had been, yeah, I think, over a month. Uh, if you had documented evidence, like let's say you were uh, in Colorado in the States and you used legally and you had video evidence from the time of your use to how many days later when you got pulled, um, would there be any defense of, of not being impaired when they tested you and you tested positive? Is there any way to challenge that legally based on the, the distance of time? I'm certain in those circumstances you could prove you were not impaired. And you could make it very clear to the magistrate that you had no impairment at all. 
um, but it's irrelevant because they're not testing for impairment. In fact, the police standard operating procedures have in bold type, we do not test for impairment. So it's just the mere presence of the drug in your system. There are a small subset of cases where you might be able to um, um, avoid a conviction. Um, but it wouldn't challenge the legal grounds of that entire... Well, what one would be where you had an honest and reasonable mistake. And in fact, there was a guy called Mark Carroll um, who was from up this region and he used the honest and reasonable mistake defence. But his circumstances were quite specific. He'd got pulled over by the police on an RDT um, about um, a month or six weeks earlier. He was pulled over and he failed the test. And he had a chat with the... He remonstrated with the police. He said, hey, what's this? You know, I, I hadn't smoked for like a day or something. And um, the police said, look, mate, these tests are really sensitive. You've got to wait... At some, you've got to really wait at least a week before you're safe to drive. That's what I'd say to you. You've got to wait at least a week. And so he went, OK, sure. Um, and while he was still awaiting, he was still in the, in the queue to go to court. So he had, he'd had his licence suspended and he was still in the queue to go to court. Um, he'd been driving around again. He gets pulled over again and fails it again. And he goes, ah, shit me. I waited more than a week. You guys said wait more than a week. I thought that was lawful. And, um, and when he gave that explanation to the magistrate, the magistrate said, well, you did everything reasonable to comply with the law. Um, it was an honest and reasonable mistake and he avoided the conviction. But those are pretty extreme circumstances and the police no longer give any kind of um, off-the-cuff advice to you after the Carroll case. Yep. Uh, this one came up in, in conversation last night. Although it would be difficult to prove one way or the other, um, are you aware of the legal implications of um, using cannabis in a jurisdiction in which it is actually legal and then coming into Australia Mm. and then being tested. Do you know what the situation actually is there? Yeah, the situation doesn't make a hoot of difference. Um, if you're driving on the roads in New South Wales with the presence of any of these four drugs in your system, that's the offence. It might have been perfectly legal where you took it. And indeed, we're going to almost certainly see a series of cases uh, where people who have got legally prescribed medicinal cannabis in this state are going to be losing their licence in those same circumstances. It's not a defence. And, and in fact, I mean, normally in those circumstances, you'd say, well, at least the magistrate will be able to take it into account on sentencing and not take your licence off you. The way the law operates in New South Wales is you get one shot at that. So if you come before a magistrate once and you explain the circumstances and you say how sorry you were and you thought you weren't impaired and et cetera, et cetera, then you can get what's called a section 10 if the magistrate's feeling nice and they will find the conviction proved, but they won't record it. But they'll say, if you do it again, you'll be in all sorts of strife. And then if you get brought back again any time within, I think, five years, the magistrate can't give you a second section 10. Automatic suspension, minimum six months. Um, it's a really, um, you know, really uh, inflexible, brutal um, and tough law. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, what? Yeah, no worries. Um, I came at the end of this, uh, my little girl was, we were just trying to get her settled. Um, I've been on the methadone, or well, I was on the methadone program for eight years and obviously there was no issues with driving. Um, also been on diazepam, I haven't been on those substances for about five or six years. Where is the, the argument behind those things being, uh, you know, just and being, you being able to drive on them and, 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 and at least medicinal marijuana not being? That was... I'm probably coming too late, but so. <laughs> yeah, well, there is no justification. And, um, oh, no, no, and actually, that's great examples. Um, you know, methadone does sort of dull your driving capacity. And I mean, you, I don't need to tell you, methadone dulls your driving capacity. You shouldn't be behind the wheel of a vehicle if you've just consumed methadone. They're not testing for that. They're not testing for heroin. Um, you know, they're not testing for prescription drugs that you, that all of us would have experience with people we know or ourselves where they seriously impair your capacity to drive. And yet we've got a system of laws in place that waves those people through, regardless of how impaired they are, but, but, but you know, pings you if you have the tiny trace element of cannabis in your system. Yep. Yeah, um, David, I've just got one question. I heard on the grapevine, and I read this ages ago, that the New South Wales government was busy passing legislation to allow the police to be judge, juries and executioners when it came to these RDTs. 
has that been passed? Because we've kind of, as in, so basically you won't go to court unless you want to challenge it. That um, if you're caught with um, basically the, you know, if you do not pass the test, you instantly um, lose your licence. Is that correct? Um, they proposed these um, changes at the end of last year as part of a package of changes, also to do with being found in possession of drugs at music festivals and the like to issue like a ticket and, and almost like a, penal, like a penalty notice, the same as you get with a major parking offence or a speeding offence. Treat them like that, and therefore there would be no discretion. You'd have an automatic um, suspension of licence. It wouldn't happen on the roadside. It had happened following the um, lab test coming back, but you'd get, the proposal is, once the lab test came back, instead of getting a notice to go to court, you'd get a notice that your, your licence was automatically suspended for three months and you had a $500 fine or a $1,000 fine. And if you wanted to challenge that, you could challenge it and go to court. But if you lost, you have to pay the court fees. Right. Um, okay. So that's what they want to change it to. The law hasn't gone through to do that yet. They haven't got all their ducks in a row. Okay. Um, yeah, but well. that's coming to a... Um, post box near you at some point, I would imagine. Yeah, because um, it seems that, uh, you know, the judiciary is often um, willing to listen and to um, the Section yeah. 10, um, you know, prevails for a lot of people and it seems that maybe... Terrible the way... Don't like that. Terrible the way the judges listen to people, isn't it? We've, <laughs> we've got a... The, 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 the New South Wales government <laughs> regularly gets pissed off that magistrates in particular actually listen to people understand their actual circumstances and then craft a penalty that meets that person's circumstances and they're trying to whatever they can wipe that out and just have one size fits all justice and i've got to tell you it just as a little digression we're increasingly saying instead of things going to court where fines are handed out or penalties are handed out by by judges we're increasingly seeing penalty notices used um, for driving offences, for drink driving offences, for these kinds of drug, drug um, use offences. And a penalty notice says, regardless of how rich you are, regardless of your personal circumstances, everybody gets the same penalty, everybody pays the same fine. And if you're struggling to get by week by week on Newstart or a really low income, and you get whacked with a $500 fine, it could be catastrophic. But of course, if you're, um, if you're an MP or if you're a lawyer, you're doing well for yourself, a $500 fine, you just go, oh, you know, no, you don't like it, but it's hardly going to major, have a major impact on your life. That's not justice. That's rich person's justice being visited against poor people, and it's an increasing trend in how we deliver justice in this state. Wow. Um, thank you very much, David. Um, uh, I was going to say, tomorrow, uh, you and Fiona Patton are having a, um, a breakfast out here on the town hall uh, deck. I think it's so, Wake and Bake. Thank you. Yeah. Wake and Bake at 9 a.m. So if you'd like to yeah, talk to Fiona and David more about their plans, um, please come along to Wake and Bake at 9 a.m. just out here on the uh, town hall deck. Okay. Thanks, okay. everyone.